What is it that makes a great fight scene great? What separates the contenders from the also-rans? We're gonna pick through the best fights in anime, scrape by scrape and blow by blow to find out. I'm Jeff Thu, and this is Animele. Anime characters get into fights for lots of reasons. For revenge, for honor, to protect a loved one or their own interests, to win a big prize in a tournament, or to reclaim the soul of their grandfather that was stolen by an evil billionaire using a cursed video cassette as part of a complex long con antique jewelry heist. The world of anime is a world of infinite possibilities, and thus infinite potential causes for conflict. But some of the best fights in anime are simple results of two characters being incapable of seeing eye to eye. These fights are as much clashes of ideology as they are you know, the, the regular kind of clash. And one of the most fascinating examples in recent memory comes from the new Shonen Jump smash hit, Demon Slayer. The climactic battle between Tanjiro and Rui that caps off the Natagumo mountain arc. To talk about that properly, I will need to spoil the show up to episode 20, just to warn you if you're not caught up. While many great shonen battles have a lot of build-up leading into them, this one pops up rather unceremoniously in the middle of what seems at first blush to be a much bigger, more important fight. After cutting their way through the army of corpse puppets protecting the mountain, Tanjiro and Inosuke cross paths with an enormous spider-headed demon who demands they leave his family alone. Tanjiro's heard that one of the demon leaders, the Twelve Kizuki, is lurking somewhere on this mountain, and this is a clear chance to get the special blood he needs for Nezuko's cure. Unfortunately, after a frantic battle, Tanjiro's killing blow is interrupted by a whole tree to the face, and before he can blink, he's sent flying to parts unknown, leaving Inosuke to fight the horrifying Hulk alone. Tanjiro lands in a clearing some distance away, but before he can head back into battle, he's distracted by a nearby scream. Concerned, he investigates, only to find a boy from the Spider Clan hurting his own sister for reasons unknown. The boy, Rui, proclaims that an outsider has no business in this squabble, that this is just an example of their bond as siblings. But family means everything to Tanjiro, who's put his life on the line for his sister more times than he can count, and he takes serious issue with that statement. He declares the demon sibling's bond to be a forgery, built not on love and trust, but on fear and hatred. He's interrupted by the appearance of another demon slayer, who pegs the kids for easy prey and, without heeding Tanjiro's cautions, moves in for a quick kill. Which is… exactly what he gets. Clearly, this kid isn't a pushover, and Tanjiro just pissed him off, big time. Family also means everything to Rui, you see. He's built his entire identity around it, and he's not about to let some interloper insult what he's worked so hard to help build. He gives Tanjiro an ultimatum, stand by his words and die slowly, or take them back and have a quick and painless end. Despite the threats, Tanjiro chooses to stand by his convictions. He's not about to lose a fight to some kid, not when Inosuke's life is on the line and one of the Twelve Kizuki is so close. His worries in that department are a bit misplaced, though. Giyu Tomioka shows up to help Inosuke, dispatching the spider beast with two quick cuts, which he's able to do because it's just a regular demon, not one of the deadly Twelve Kizuki. That would be Rui. Outmatched and armed with a wildly inaccurate estimation of his foe's power, the early stages of this fight don't go well for Tanjiro. Urokodaki's training does him well, and his nose is sharp enough to pick up on the scent of Rui's threads, but those are sharper still, cutting through Tanjiro's sword in a single stroke like butter. And they're fast, too. Even with his best efforts to dodge them, Tanjiro can't get anywhere near close enough to test his newly abridged sword on Rui's neck. Animator Shun Yamaoka does a fantastic job of selling the threat posed by the webs, lending them ominous speed, weight, and power through his animation despite how slender and fragile they appear to be. After giving Tanjiro a severe lashing, Rui presents him with one last chance to recant, and when he refuses, responds by bringing down a whole web to slice him to ribbons. But just when all seems lost, Nezuko leaps out to take a blow for her brother, and in doing so, changes the entire direction of the fight. The significance of this moment is emphasized by employing an absolutely stunning slow motion effect. Nezuko's splattering blood hangs in the air before Tanjiro's stunned face. In a wide shot, we see her expression gradually shift from angry determination to panic terror, and her confidently outstretched fingers clench inward as the pain of the attack sets in and she starts to collapse. All while her clothes and hair billow realistically in the wind, as do Tanjiro's. Every part of the frame is alive at once in this shot. The thought and care that went into crafting this one moment is incredible, but so is the effect that it employs, which is used several other times throughout the fight. 
It's so damn smooth, animated on ones to sell that high-speed camera feel, yet somehow the line art across every one of those frames remains perfectly consistent. I honestly don't know how they did it. The blood does bear a few obvious hallmarks of automatic frame interpolation, where a computer is used to dynamically generate in-between frames based on an artist's keyframes instead of having a person draw them all by hand. But remarkably, none of those signs can be seen on the drawings of the characters themselves, so either someone animated every frame of that by hand, which would be nuts considering how much moves in this shot, or the compositing of the effect is completely seamless. Either way, very impressive in either case. Key animator Gokimura and Ufotable's photography department both deserve a pat on the back for this one. In the aftermath of the attack, Tanjiro scrambles to take his sister to cover and put her back together, but Nezuko's bought them more time than he realizes, as seeing them protect each other has sparked a change of heart of sorts in Rui, which won't stop him from trying to kill them, but has changed his priorities. As we learn in flashbacks after the fight, Rui created the Spider Clan by luring weaker demons to his side with promises of protection and power. In exchange, he forced them to play house, essentially, taking on rigid family roles that they were never suited to, and answering every failure to live up to his warped expectations with torture and death. After killing his own original family out of fear and living for many long, painful years with the guilt, Rui has forgotten what real love even looks like. All he has left is power, and with it, he can only create a hollow facsimile of the family bond he's always craved. Like most abusers, he knows that deep down, which is why he's so violently insistent that his family must never revert to their true forms, why none of them can ever please him no matter how hard they try or what they do, and why Tanjiro's criticism filled him with so much rage. Every crack in the facade makes it harder for him to lie to himself. In Tanjiro and Nezuko's devotion to each other, though, Rui finally sees what he's been missing. Real love. Closer than it's ever been in all the years he's kept his family isolated on the mountainside. But all he can do is see it for what it is and recognize that it's something he wants. He doesn't know how to love. All he knows is hurt and fear. And with that limited tool set, all he can think to do to get what he wants is take it from someone else. Which, twisted as he is, he frames as an act of generosity, offering to let Tanjiro live in exchange for his sister. Though of course our hero sees right through that, calling Rui on his bullshit, and as the music triumphantly swells, he steps out to defend his sister from the monster. Rui responds by laughing and revealing the reason behind his confidence. As Tanjiro and the audience have already begun to suspect, he is the Twelve Kizuki of Natagumo Mountain. Sorry for spoiling that twist a couple minutes ago, I just felt like the context was necessary to give a proper analysis. To further put Tanjiro in his place, Rui follows this up with a demonstration of overwhelming strength and speed, using his webs to snatch Nezuko right from behind him. It doesn't work, of course. Tanjiro responds by charging forward immediately, while Nezuko shows Rui that she's not on board for his plans by telling it straight to his face. In retaliation, he flings his webs toward Tanjiro, who dodges under them only to realize a second later that it wasn't an attack at all. Rather, Rui was flinging Nezuko up into the trees above as punishment for defying him. The sight of his precious sister dangling bloody and disfigured above him as Rui coldly explains how he's going to train her sends Tanjiro into a blind rage, which isn't a great state to be in when you're fighting a sadistic, highly intelligent, super strong demon. He barely manages to deflect the next wave of webs, falling face first onto the ground, where Rui is all too happy to uh, help him up. The beating that follows is absolutely savage. Makoto Nakamura animates Rui's punches and kicks with a casual nonchalance, choosing to sell his devastating power with airburst effects around his fists, and by reflecting the true weight of each blow in Tanjiro's bloodied, ragdolling body. After landing a few hits, Rui pauses to taunt Tanjiro, walking up and challenging him to take a free swipe at his neck. After whiffing and catching a few more devastating blows as punishment, Tanjiro does manage to connect, only to find that Rui's flesh is even tougher than his webs. Confident that he's finally asserted his dominance, the villain casually kicks Tanjiro away, his body skipping across the ground before crashing violently into a distant hill. Luckily, he lands head first, so it doesn't do too much damage. Seeing her precious brother beaten so brutally sends Nezuko into a blind rage as well. She begins howling and thrashing at her bonds, and, of course, Rui responds by tightening them. She's his sister now, after all, and he won't put up with that kind of impertinence from her. 
Her actual brother can't stand to see her subjected to that kind of abuse, but recognizing his past mistake, Tanjiro holds himself back. As Rui muses that Nezuko's aura is different from other demons, our hero takes advantage of the brief exposition break to calm himself down and, more importantly, to breathe. A moment later, he charges forward, unleashing the Breath of Water's devastating and devastatingly beautiful tenth form, Constant Flux. Masayuki Kunihiro demonstrates his knack for exciting, dynamic camera work in animating Tanjiro's confident charge, while his impressive effects animation brings the attack to life. With his first few swings, it's all Tanjiro can do to deflect Rui's webs, but with each rotation he gets faster and faster, stronger and stronger, until the dragon bears its fangs and bites through the thread entirely. At last, Rui feels truly threatened, and before Tanjiro can do some real damage, he decides to end the fight quickly, pouring more blood into his webs to strengthen them for a final, unavoidable attack. Trapped in a quickly closing cage of death with no way out, Tanjiro's life flashes before his eyes, a running theme in this particular arc. Both Inosuke and Zenitsu have a similar experience in their fights against the father and elder brother spiders, respectively, which serve to fill us in on a bit of their backstory and, in Zenitsu's case, show how he came to be such a singularly talented swordsman. The show even posits a theory as to why this happens, that we search our memories when death is certain, hoping to discover a hidden way out in our pasts, and in the fragmented web of his mind, that's exactly what Tanjiro finds. A memory, underscored by the soft, haunting melody of Go Shina and Nami Nakagawa's insert song Tanjiro Kamado no Uta, of an old, traditional charcoal cutter's dance, passed down to him by an ailing, bedridden father who used a special breathing technique to dance from sunrise to sunset in the freezing cold without fatiguing. The Hinokami Kagura, or Dance of the Fire God, a family treasure forgotten long ago, now remembered and cast in new light by Tanjiro's years spent studying the blade. His eyes flash open with sudden understanding, and as he draws in new breath, the gorgeous insert song comes roaring back with newfound intensity. In an instant, the water dragon surrounding his blade transforms into raging fire, and with a whirling slash, he breaks through the attack and charges forward, Rui's threads scattering harmlessly around him like well, like a ripped spider's web. Rui's follow-up attack isn't quite so harmless, carving some deep gashes into Tanjiro's body as he runs past. Yet he barrels forward through the pain, unable to stop lest the strain of changing breathing techniques mid-fight leave him paralyzed on the ground. The show at least gives us a brief breather, using that same incredible slow motion technique to highlight the danger our hero is facing, the foe he must overcome, and what's at stake if he fails while giving the music space to reach its climax in time with the action. Tanjiro Kamado no Uta soars as its namesake does the same, gliding gracefully through the gauntlet of threads before him and closing the distance to Rui in a few short breaths. For perhaps the first time in decades, the demon feels the terror that he was so fond of inflicting on others and beats a hasty retreat. This sequence, too, was handled by Masayuki Kunihiro, and it's without question one of the most jaw-dropping bits of Sakuga animation I've ever seen. The camera work, choreography, and character animation are all impeccable, and the harsh light and shadow created by Tanjiro's flames lends the attack a distinct intensity, isolating the combatants within an otherwise blackened battlefield. This highlighting effect allows us to easily follow the rapid animation at full speed as the characters dart around the screen. No matter how far or how many times Rui jumps back, Tanjiro is there, dogging at his heels, slashing confidently through each and every thread until he sees the only one that matters. The opening thread that will guide his blade through the monster's neck. He moves for the kill, not caring if Rui slashes him to pieces in the process. And he might well have suffered that fate if he was alone. Even after death, the love of Tanjiro's father and the lessons he passed down protected the boy. And likewise, even from beyond the grave, the loving words of their mother roused Nezuko from her sleep and back to action. So it's not some ancient OP technique or Nezuko's hidden power that really defeats Rui. The true advantage that the siblings have over him is the bond they share with each other and their entire family. A bond that gives them strength beyond anything the lonely, abusive monster could ever hope to achieve individually. That, as Tanjiro proclaims, cannot be severed, and its strength allows them to cut through every last bond in Rui's web of terror. 
Well, okay, both the Hinokami Kagura and Nezuko's newly awakened blood demon art, Exploding Blood, put in work as well. The latter doing eh, pretty much exactly what it says on the tin, burning through the last of Rui's blood-soaked webs in the explosion and opening them up for a clean finishing blow. And again, the show really knows how to sell the impact of that moment, by allowing us to hear Nezuko's voice calling out the attack for the first time since she became a demon. And good girl that she is, she's not done helping yet. Even with his father's breathing technique, Tanjiro's blade alone isn't quite strong enough to sever Rui's flesh, but the drops of Nezuko's blood on the blade ignite, and the now molten metal proves enough to break through in a stunning circular flourish. A flying head, a determined glare, roll credits in the hypest episode conclusion of the year. The next episode picks up right where we left off, with the flames on Tanjiro's blade flickering out and Rui's head hitting the forest floor feet away. Both of our heroes quickly follow him to the ground, where an exhausted Tanjiro immediately begins crawling toward Nezuko, determined to first reach his sister, then to continue fighting to save the rest of his friends. But he's counted this victory a bit too soon. Rui rises back to his feet, revealing that, in a classic Dio Brando move, he decapitated himself at the last moment to avoid death. Even with the help of Nezuko's flames, even after pushing his body past its limits and pouring all of his family's wisdom into his blade, Tanjiro's best just wasn't good enough. Now the enraged demon plans to kill them both out of pure spite. And as his goofily named but nonetheless deadly finishing move, the murderous eye basket, closes in, Tanjiro realizes he's reached his limits. No matter how he breathes, he can't raise his sword. He's doomed. So, was Rui right? Is raw power and the terror it inflicts really all that matters? Of course not. Because while Tanjiro and Nezuko aren't yet powerful enough to beat a boss demon like Rui on their own, and this early in the series they really shouldn't be, unlike him, they aren't alone. Though they couldn't finish the fight, their combined efforts did buy just enough time for Gyu Tomioka, a surrogate brother of sorts by way of their shared master Urokodaki, to arrive and save the day. When one fights for and with their family, that means that they can lean on the power of others to do what they cannot. And what Tomioka can do to finish this fight is something else. As Rui readies his most powerful attack, the Water Hashira calmly assumes a defensive stance, activating an eleventh water-breathing form of his own invention, Dead Calm. Though he appears to be still, his blade moves faster than the eye can see, slashing through every last one of Rui's most powerful threads in an instant. The next instant, within a literal blink of an eye, Giyu has closed the distance and rended the boy's head from his shoulders. Then, after almost a full episode's worth of flashbacks exploring Rui's tragic origin story as well as the tragic origin stories that he inflicted on his so-called family, we return to the battlefield to watch his disintegrating corpse stumble toward Nezuko and Tanjiro in its final moments, the last example of real love he'll ever see in this world. And Tanjiro, infinitely loving guy that he is, reaches out to comfort the monstrous child in his final moments, despite everything that he's put them through. That's enough to remind Rui of his long-forgotten love for his parents and the immense guilt that he feels for having killed them. But they hold no grudge. He finds them waiting for him on the other side, ready to spend eternity burning in hell just so that they can be with him forever. Because that's what real love does to you. It makes you willing, even happy, to go through hell if it means that you can care for someone and be cared for by them in turn. And that lesson, ultimately, is what this fight was all about. Which isn't really all that novel. There are countless shonen battles that claim to have been won through the power of love, which mostly just boils down to the hero thinking about his friends while delivering the killing blow. But what sets this one apart, what makes it one of the best fights in anime history, period, is that it actually delivers fully on that romantic promise. Through this fight, Demon Slayer works to explore exactly why love is so powerful, how it benefits us individually and as groups. To emphasize those benefits, the series then crafts an antagonistic force to embody love's opposite, control by way of abuse, symbolized in a deadly web closing in on you from every side. Finally, it incorporates its understanding of the bond between Nezuko and Tanjiro into its fight choreography, allowing the very concept of love to be what physically defeats Rui's terror. That, to me, is downright poetic. And it's beautiful, thoughtful writing like that, combined with jaw-dropping animation, unmatched visual effects work, and breathtaking music, which has made Demon Slayer an almost instant classic. 
Let me know in the comments below what other fights you'd like to see me tackle on Animelee, and while you're still here, I sure would appreciate it if you'd hit the subscribe button and maybe check out my in-depth scientific analysis of why Inosuke is best boy. Or if you're looking for something new to fill the hole that Demon Slayer just left in your heart, then I'd suggest watching my list of the best new anime of fall 2019. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.